I was, it's good to be back with everybody. Um, last week, my, my family and I were away, but I uh, um, saw Kaylee doing some st uh, stuff with County Chorus, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but then uh, Michael did a great job filling in, preaching, and uh, Michael, you got to break in. Did you break in the wonderful pulpit? Oh, yeah. oh man, this is cool. <laughs> this thing's great. Like, oh, it's, I mean, it's broader. I have a little workspace here, and I do want to give, if there's anybody else I need to, I apologize, but I am aware that this is um, uh, just a gift of love from um, Joe and Dave, and so I want to, and I just thank Joe for it and for kind of like having the brainchild of it. Um, I had actually been planning to do something like a workspace, and um, then all of a sudden this just, you know, showed up, and Joe was there, so I was like, wow, it's beautiful. Um, and the cross, that was, it was here, but it would have come up to like, you know, in front of my face, so we decided, let's put it up there. So, um, the really, I think, for me, I'm just going to tell you a little, this backstory to me for fun for the moment, um, is that years ago in our old church in Connecticut, um, for many, many years, the pa my friend, the pastor there, he did the same thing. He just spoke off of, a, off of a music stand, and I was like, Bill, you need a pulpit. You know, you need something to preach from. And so, I was like, I want to build you something. And so I did, and I built him this. Uh, they still use it today, like amazing. Like, I don't know what it is. 15 years later, they still use this thing. It's very congregational, as he said. It's like, got this, and then two side things, and all sorts, you know, it's a little bit of pomp and circumstance in this laid-back vineyard church, you know. So anyway, um, it's really fun to like all of a sudden be the pastor and on the receiving end of that kind of a gift. So um, all that I'm making of it, but I really do appreciate it. It's, it's a wonderful blessing. So, um, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Mark 4. Michael, last week, set the table very nicely, I felt, for what we're going to go into is uh, an extended discussion. I'm going to call these more discussions instead of like a series. Because in a series, maybe you know where you're going to start and where you're going to stop. But in a discussion, I really don't know where I'm going to stop. I know where I'm going to start, but I'm not all sure when it's going to stop. So um, we're going to go into this time of talking about hearing from God. Uh, but before we do that, I want to, I would just want to set the table right now. Um, or sorry, not set the table. My, again, Michael did a great job of that. But in Mark 4, I want to talk tonight in an, in an in-between way, between that and when we get into it. Mark 4, I want to talk tonight about peace in the storms of life. So just read with me for, for a moment. Peace in the storms of life is what I'm calling my message tonight. Starting at verse 35. It says, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him, they took with him with them in the boat, just as he was. And, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. I don't know if you'll be able to see this all that well. I'll try to hold it up here for you. It's a picture of a camera. This sits in our kitchen and serves as a reminder of how to uh, make the best out of life circumstances, basically. And so it says... Life is like a camera. First of all, focus on what's important. And then it says, capture the good times. 
develop from the negatives. And if things don't work out, take another shot. Not a bad, it's, it's not a, at all a bad kind of you know, exhortation and encouragement and a reminder. But I started looking at this in preparation for this message and I thought to myself, when it comes to, and if things don't work out, this thing over here, make the most of the negatives, and if things don't work out, and I'm thinking, what's missing for us as Christians in this? And my, I, I, I'm thinking to myself, like, in my household, a professing Christian household, not that I'm a pastor, like that may accentuate the point, but just that, I, that we are followers of Jesus. What would be missing in here? When, life's, when life has struggles, what's missing in this kind of an encouragement? I'll cut to the chase so you're not sitting there too long. And my answer is, any talk of God's involvement, any talk of God's place in the midst of the storms of life when things don't go well see there's a christian distinctive like i've been mentioning here and there all the time is that there's always something that sets christianity apart from every other religion in the world on any given subject and what i'm looking at is how do we handle the hardships of life. I want to talk tonight about our response to when things don't work out, when they're not going well with us. The Christian distinctive is that, in fact, according to Scripture, is that we, as the people of God, have the promises of God to live, a, to live with peace and live with peace in the midst of the storm. That's Colossians uh, 3.15. And to have a more abundant life, John 10.10. 10. And yet, I want to ask you, where are you? Where have you been lately? We're coming out of probably the fog and the haze of, of Christmas and Thanksgiving. And What happens in the midst of that when life hasn't gone all that well? In the midst of all that intensity, and then you throw on top of that the stuff of life that happens on top of all the stress and the busyness. And life's not going well. How do we handle this? The Christian distinctive is that in the promises of Scripture, we have promises that say we live above this. We are, we are not... Um, uh, beaten by it but we are victorious in it or we can have peace in the midst of it and yet I want to ask you, are you when this has happened with you have you experienced that sort of peace or have you been more would you describe it yourself as more under the weight of the stress of your circumstances what I've been, I, I want to address tonight something that I feel I've been noticing in our fellowship that has been going on with us. And in identifying this, I want to give us, my goal is to, is to enable us, to help us have tools and equipping for how to handle the storms of life. Be <coughs> because what I've been noticing is that it seems that a, a good number of us are under the weight of the pressures of life lately in the last six, eight weeks. And it seems, from what I can witness, is that it affects us. And I'm not telling you to, this is what I want you to hear right up front, I'm not telling you to put on a mask. But instead, I want to look at what does the Bible say about how to live above these circumstances in Jesus and not be taken down by them. To give us biblical aids to generate God's life cycle in our lives. And so tonight, what I, what I see as I've been looking at this topic and thinking, how do I give practical 
aid, biblical information to this subject that's not happy clappy, that's not about putting on masks. How do I do this? What I find is that it comes down to two things according to what I see in Scripture. It comes down first to priorities and second to our perceptions about life. And so uh, priorities and perceptions. I'm going to talk with us today about the acceptability, what I'm calling the acceptability of being in need, that these things are, are, life does happen, and it is acceptable and okay to be in a place of, I need, I'm hurting, it's okay. However, as we talk about that, we're also going to talk about aligning our priorities with God's kingdom priorities and aligning our perspectives with the perspective of heaven. Because if Jesus could have peace in the midst of a storm, the clear translation is, in our storms of life, isn't that available to us? And yet if we're not experiencing that, then the question we need to ask ourselves is, what's happening for us? What is going on on this side of heaven? What's going on down here as opposed to up there in God's space because we want these two things to converge your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so peace in the midst of the storm turn right now as we begin turn with me to James 5 James 5 couple quick verses, 13 to 16. It says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So we have this, in this passage, we have this like duality, this tension between things that are going well and things that are not going so well. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. If anyone's cheerful, then let him dance. Let him sing songs of praise. Like, go ahead and live in your moment. Encounter the emotions that you have. They're indicators for us. And so, we've had this saying historically in the vineyard that it's okay to be okay, and it's okay to not be okay. But as I set the table for talking about the priorities and the perceptions of life circumstances, with what I want to convey to us tonight, as I set the table, I want to start here in this passage because I want to make sure, I'm going to double back on some comments that I've made, some things I've been speaking to us over the last number of weeks and months, and I want to double back and make sure that my expressions are clear so that there's not misunderstanding. If you've heard me saying over, you know, in November, December, whatever, as we talked about this five-fold ministry and stuff about being on mission. And if you've heard me say that, that any phrase that is like, church is not about you, as I have said that, I am not saying, I want to make clear that just in case, but I am not saying it's not okay to have a bad day in church. It's not okay, and I'm not saying therefore you need to put your mask on and come to church and be all happy clappy. Because we've had a value historically within, our, within the vineyard churches of it is okay to not be okay. Because like this passage tells us, that the body ministers to the body. We are the body of Christ. We minister one to another. If someone's sick, let him pray and the effective prayers of, of the body of Christ will make the person well. So, so there's this thing of, look, 
I'm having a bad day. Can you pray for me? Right? Because love flows in that. The community and relational equity is built out of that. I want to just, I'm doubling back on this just to make sure that this is clear that I, so that I'm not misheard. And you don't think, Rip's a harsh taskmaster and he's all about just getting the goals done and whatever. But what I'm, what I'm trying to break when I'm saying that is these things of, in, in the church of Jesus, especially in the West today, of, well, I'm going to pick church like a smorgasbord. Whichever one most suits my needs and my needs and my kids' needs and I'm going to go to where they have the broadest program things for my needs and, or I think I'm going to leave now because the church really isn't meeting my needs now. Like, it's that when I'm talking about, you see, that mentality and being missional, I don't believe they can coexist. And so... When I've said that in the past, it's really trying to address that kind of thing and within our fellowship cast vision and draw attention to the difference so that we can be on the same page about understanding that really this whole thing is about Jesus, the Father, and the Father's glory. First and foremost, it's all about Him. And that there are ways that we in the church have missed it, built things that don't quite look probably like God would have them, but he loves us so much and he goes with us. He's so gracious and kind in that way. All right, I think I've made that point. I won't continue to belabor it. But again, just to say that we don't put on, this is not trying to convince us to put on a mask. We value being real and we value being vulnerable with each other. So that you can know my life, you can know when I'm struggling. I've tried to model that here. You know when, you know, you know when my kids have screwed up and you know when Anne Marie messed up. Um, so, not again. <laughs> not again, right. So we have that dynamic of, okay, when we're here, that we can be real with each other. And that is a distinctive of the kingdom that we can actually be real and it, it is part of how we encounter God's kingdom. And yet, Ecclesiastes also tells us there's a time for everything under the sun. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. And so there are, there's a time and a season for all things under heaven that at times... Even our needs take a back seat to the Lord. And this is a matter of kingdom priorities. Getting our priorities in the appropriate times and spaces in line with God's kingdom priorities. And so what, turn to Matthew 6.33. A little back in, some pages back early in the New Testament. First book of the New Testament. Matthew 6:33 I could read it out read it for bit or from I could say it from memory but it's good to read it Matthew 6:33 says but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you And so seeking first is a matter of prioritizing we seek the kingdom first this seeking of the kingdom first is not a passive thing we don't sit back and just wait for the kingdom to happen upon us. We can't sit back. When, when the storms of life are, are, are on us, when we're in the midst of junk and, and you know whatever it may be for you, we don't sit back and wait for things to get better. In this, I mean, there's always a tension between how this all works out. But... In seeking first the kingdom of God, there's an intentional lifestyle that includes intentionally realigning my priorities in a given when the times are appropriate. And so what I would say is this. 
I want to just talk for a moment about our worship gatherings. There's something that I've been noticing for us. Now, correct me if I'm wrong on the side, but when we discern, when there is discernment, and uh, what I've been seeing is at times, especially through the holidays for some reason, it may have just been the holidays and the, the culmination of the two, but there's been a weight in our worship gatherings. Not the weight of the glory of God. This is a weight of heaviness, a burden, where Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the opposite. And so that would be the enemy is at work. And I, I believe we've carried our, we, if, yeah, we, we can carry our burdens, we can carry our stresses and our cares and all the junk we carry it into the worship setting. And what, when that happens, what can happen is that it can get in the way of worshiping God. And I'm, again, I want to make clear that I'm not telling you to put on a mask. What I'm trying to do tonight is give us tools to handle the stresses and the struggles of life in a constructive way and in ways that I believe are biblical. So not only would it affect our worship gathering here in our fellowship, but also you can take these things home with you, literally, and put them into practice, is this. Because the struggles of life often distract our focus from God, even, or even when we've gathered to worship. And I would say, if there's a time and a season for everything, when we've gathered to worship, the first priority, as I'm seeing it according to scriptures, the first priority is that time is seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the king and his kingdom. There's a fine line between worshiping God out of our circumstances. When we worship God, as I'm putting this, if we worship God out of our circumstances, it's where we are so weighed down that we don't actually worship God. We kind of watch everything happen. This would be waiting to worship God until circumstances change. This kind of, this kind of uh, posture would be sitting and not engaging with the worship time. This is focused on us and it's focused on our problems at hand. Then there would be the fine line between that and what I'm calling worshiping God in the midst of the circumstance. Where... This would be worshiping God no matter what our circumstances are. Good, bad, and different. We worship God because of who God is, not because of what's going on in our life. And these two can be separated because no matter what's going on in our life, God is so much more. He's so much other. He's so, much glo so glorious that he's, He is actually worthy of our praise regardless of what's going on in our life. So we, we worship God for who he is. Now, Brent was telling me a story um, that he heard of a pastor in this, when we talk about priorities and, and how even when we come into worship, having our priorities in the midst of the struggles we walked in the door with, that prioritizing the kingdom and prioritizing the king and therefore worship of the king above the circumstances makes everything else fall into line. And Brent was telling me of this pastor who he'd heard, I guess online, I, I believe, who was saying that at one point in his life, he had lost his son. And this pastor told of how the very next week, probably not that week, but the very next week, he was in church. He didn't, he didn't preach, but he, was, he gathered with his, with his family, of, of, uh, with the family of God. And he worshiped God. He put the stuff of his life behind the worship of God. And, and in doing so, the pastor told his testimony was that what happened for him was that the weight and the burden and all the junk and the grief of having lost 
their child, even just a week earlier, began to uh, just fall off of him. All the junk began to fall off of this man as he was worshiping God. And what he found was that his circumstances hadn't changed, but peace entered his life in that moment. Now, what would have happened if he had come and sat or didn't come at all? But even if he had come and sat and was, was completely taken with his grief of his son and couldn't prioritize that God is still God and worthy of the praise and put this into alignment first and give the worship to God that he deserves no matter, our circ no matter his circumstance. If he hadn't done that, it's not because God doesn't like him all of a sudden. He wasn't pleasing God. It's that the very nature of the kingdom is that when things are aligned, the peace of the kingdom can flow, the joy of the kingdom can flow in our lives. This passage tells us then, Matthew 6.33 tells us that if we have kingdom priorities aligned, the internal life changes regardless of our external lives. Make sense? And so the next... The next uh, when you have this, and, and what Brent said was that this, this gentleman told him, or not told him, but was testifying to, not once he had the alignment right, then all of a sudden his perspective of his circumstances began to change. And that's the second thing is, not only do we have the prioritizing, but, but also to watch our, pers our perspectives. And... First of all, I'm going to refer you to Job 42. I'm going to take for granted right now that all of us know of Job here in this room. I'll just take that for granted right now. But in Job 42, Job is just coming off of God's engagement with him in chapter 41. You can go read it yourself. I'm referencing it so that hopefully, you know, leave them wanting just enough and you're going to go back and want to read it for yourself. But see, in Job 41, <clears throat> Job's been saying all these things, he's not cursing God, but he's really lamenting like, what in the world? I am a righteous man and why is this falling on me? And all of a sudden, God says, I, I would shudder if God ever said this to me. Gird yourself, for I will come and talk with you. I don't even, I think I would melt if our bodies could melt. I, that's, I mean, if you could feel what's going on in my own body right now at the thought, it's really interesting. So, God, Job is taking all of his problems before the Lord. And then God basically just runs down this list. Who are you? Were you there? Can you, can you bridle Leviathan? Were you there when I hung the stars in place and set the world on its foundations? Were you there? Can you do that? Can you? And what God does is he shows him by, by explaining all of this, he shows Job all of his glory. And all of a sudden, Job's perspective goes from this to this. And he says, oh no. And his perception changes. And in seeing God, and that's part of what worship does and prioritizing the kingdom is that we see God in proper alignment and the perspective changes from our perspective to heaven's perspective. And the magnitude of our problems shrinks. Job lost 10 children, all his slaves, or all his servants, all of his wealth, and he was left with his skin afflicted with boils. And then his friends told him, you know what, go, 
Go curse God and die. This is all your fault. You, you actually, something's wrong in your life. You've done something wrong. And all these, his friends basically desert him in that sense. They accuse him. The weight of this. And yet all of that, then all of a sudden, gets compared to still the magnitude of God. And now if, if you and I were there, we would be needing, like Job, the answer of the why is this happening. Do you ever notice that once he gets a glimpse of God's magnitude and glory, Job stopped asking why? Hello? This is crazy to me. And so that's one example of having the perspective of, of heaven, I will call it. That perspective matters. But, but again, we'll just read it from the screen here. Colossians 3.2. Actually, let me jump up to Colossians because I think I'm going to read a few more verses. Colossians 3. Come on, come on, come on. Wanting to make, wanting to make time here. Here we go, Colossians 3. Starting in verse 1, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. And so I'm not talking about some over-realized, like we live in the total consummation of the now of the future kingdom. What I'm saying is, we live with heaven's perspective, though. Just like Job. Paul is saying it, it sounds very similar to what Job experienced. Don't set your mind here. And it's not telling us, live in the future, think about eternity and how good it's going to be. It's saying, set your mind on what will be. Because that's the real reality. That's the place where peace reigns eternal. And you can have that break in now when you need it. Set your, what do we do? Our perception. Set your minds on things above. Getting heaven's perspective. See, don't set your mind on the things that are here on earth, meaning in one sense it's telling us if, if we look right here, this is going to be all we see. The more I focus on my problems, the bigger my problems look. And I'm not telling us to disregard them, run away from them, ignore them, treat them as if they're not real. That's false. This is just the reality of seeing things from God's perspective and that God is in control of all this and that God has our back and that God is the one that we focus on. Or you have Peter in Matthew 14. I'm going to jump back there. Matthew 14. This is Peter. Would you like to have this one? Matthew 14. Another example of what happens depending on where, you, where we focus. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. This is in verse 28. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. I don't think this speculates at all that Peter walked on the water and not like he took two quick steps and fell in. You know, just trying to see if he could skip like a rock. He walked on the water from a distance because they couldn't really tell if it was him. And he walked from the boat to Jesus. And he gets there, and when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. Or in beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, and saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? <coughs> the point is, is that Peter, as soon as he got his eyes off of Jesus and on to the waves, the same principle is applying. All of a sudden, he got scared. 
This is what happens for all of us. When we're thinking about our stuff, we're scared. When we're thinking about him, we see how big he is. So when we were getting ready to move here, we prepared for a year. I've told you various parts of this story. I may have told you this one too, but we moved here nine and a half years ago now, so the story's getting a little old, I guess. But um, when we were preparing to move here, this was a life-altering, God-impacting, forever-changing me event in my life. Because I had to face fear. And I had spent my adult life running in fear instead. Now I had to face it. And so every time I would get my eyes, every time I had my eyes on, we're going to move to Pennsylvania. This is kind of a cool thought. I'm looking forward to being there. I don't know what the corn's like, but I know it's there. Uh, you know. But every time I thought like that, I actually had peace. I was excited. Every time I thought, how are we going to move? Where are we going to live? How am I going to get work? What about our kids? How much money will I be able to make there? Because the I don't know if the income's the same or you know, all this stuff. And how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? Every time I got off of what God had said to focus on and I got down into the hows, which is what I would say, difference of God's voice said, go to Pennsylvania. The details, the devil's in the details. How do we do all this? I got massively afraid and stressed and I, and <gasps> right? <clears throat> then the Lord said, "You know, if you would just focus on what I tell you, what I told you to do, and when I tell you to do it, keep your eyes on the big picture, you'll be fine." So then I I, I said, "Well, let me practice that." And I got my eyes off of here and I started thinking, "We're supposed to go to Pennsylvania. I don't need to think about all this. We're supposed to go to Pennsylvania." And as soon as I did that, I got my eyes back on what God had said. And in this case, I'm relating it exactly the same. Eyes on him, all of a sudden, my peace returned and all my stress went away. And I mean, not like it took me a couple days to wind down. This was instantaneous. This was as soon as I did this thinking. So, here are my conclusions. Here are my conclusions. Here are my applications. I don't know if the first one says it really well, but Brent, go ahead and put it up there. So being in a place of need, again, we said it's okay to not be okay. In its proper place and in its proper time, I would submit to you that when we worship, there are spaces and times and when, when we gather, our gatherings are spaces to worship God and other times of our gathering together are times where we are on the mission of God. And so, if our stuff gets in the way, it will distract us. When we have gathered corporately, these are the times where it's primarily about the mission of God and the worship of God. Yet, the stresses of life can get in the way of both of those things. Have you ever noticed that? It happens to me all the time. And so what I'm submitting to us is not about how do we just have a better worship service and y'all aren't living up to it. It's, it is, I've noticed this weight and this is entirely is from what I can see, it is entirely applicable to life and handling the stresses that we can keep our eyes on God's king, kingdom outside of a worship service. And we can, be, we can have our perspective about God aligned and find peace even outside of in our day-to-day -day life. And so... No matter if I'm talking about something here, we can carry this. This is available to us day to day as we are wrestling against the issues and matters of life. So that like Paul, we can have joy even though Paul was imprisoned. Or like Jesus, you can have such peace that you could be asleep in the middle of a storm. Make sense? Here's the second one. Is that, sorry, let me back up and just say quickly that 
Yet at the same time, when we gather, there are times that we minister to one another because the felt needs are real and they matter. And so the second application is this. The circumstances of life may not change. But we can have peace and joy. This is what's available to us according to Scripture. But I believe that when our eyes and our minds and our hearts are not aligned in the ways that I've described in these two points, that we miss out on what's available in the promises of God. And yet they're relatively, I think they're relatively easy tweaks to make. And so the circumstances may not change, but we can have peace and joy, and that's a Christian differential to the world. Is that in Jesus, our testimony is, I am at peace in the midst of my trials, or I am at peace in the midst of my grief, or am I, at pe- I am in joy in the midst of the junk simply because I know Jesus. That's our testimony. That's a form of the gospel. Lastly is this. The inner life is more important than the outer life. This is what I mean. When our alignment changes and when our perspective changes, the peace rests here in our heart. It rests in our inner man. The joy of the Lord flows from within our inner man, our inner self, the soul. And so from there, what can happen is Everything that's going on out here, if we don't have these two that I've described tonight, then everything that's going on out here drives and dictates how I am in here. But if I am properly aligned and have my eyes on Jesus, then actually that changes everything in here, even when this may not change but I have peace here no matter what's happening. Again, that is the Christian distinctive. That's what's available to us. I pray that the Lord will plant this in our souls. Plant this in us. And bring wonderful joy and transformation. So, while we were worshiping, one of the words that I got was... um, 